So in this video, we're going to go over the types of cellular adaptations that take place in response to environmental stress and why these responses occur. So normal cells typically have a specific function and structure that are governed by its specialization or its job. And as long as it meets the demands of the environment and the environment doesn't change, the cell can continue to handle the regular demands and it exists in a steady state called homeostasis. And these are just the regular physiologic demands that a cell is going to, uh, going to exist within. You know, for example, uh, skin cells on the outside of your body are squamous cells. They're good at withstanding abrasion uh, and some pressure and they provide you with UV protection. Cells in your stomach are glandular type of cells. They're better able to withstand an acidic environment. So there is specialization between these type of cells that allows them to survive in a certain type of environment that other cells would not be successful in. But what happens if the environment or the demands on the cell itself changes? So there's two things your cells can do. First of all, they can adapt, so they can undergo a change in some way to be able to better handle the environment or the exposed stimulus that they are existing in. And these changes are typically reversible and will occur in response to either a physiologic or a pathologic stimuli, or cells will become injured. And that can occur if the adaptive abilities of the cell are exceeded, if the change in environment is too abrupt, abrupt or drastic, if there's a deprivation of nutrients or oxygen, if the cell becomes compromised by mutations, uh, those are some of the main things. And given time, there will be two outcomes that occur. The cell can either heal and return to normal, and that typically occurs if the stimulus itself is removed, and that is a reversible injury, or the cell will undergo an irreversible injury and die. So that is something that, uh, you know, a good example to think of are skin cells when you go outside and you are exposed to too much UV radiation. Normally you get a tan, that would be an adaptation that will eventually fade over time. But if you get too much sun too quickly, those cells are gonna turn red, you're gonna get a burn. And if it's really severe, it'll actually blister and your skin will, you know, just fall off. So what are the normal adaptive responses that your cells will undergo? Typically, they will undergo either atrophy, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, or metaplasia. And keep in mind, out of these types of adaptive responses, if the stimulus for adaptation is removed, the cell is going to return back to its baseline state. Again, after the summer, when you're all tanned, winter comes along, there's no more sun, your skin's gonna revert back to its sort of normal, uh, normal skin shade. So first off, hypertrophy. Now this is an increase in the size of your cells and typically that will increase the size of the organ that the cells are involved in and also increase the functional activity of the organ itself. Now this is creating bigger cells but it is not creating new cells and that's because these cells are typically not capable of dividing. But this increase in size comes about because of a creation and assembly of new intracellular components, specifically protein and this will occur typically alongside hyperplasia. They're both hyper, so these are both an increase, but the hypertrophy is an increase in size. So one of the probably most uh, easy to visualize representations of this is, you know, if our cow friend here decides he is going to increase the functional demand on his body and lift a bunch of weights, he is going to increase both the functional demand on his muscles and stimulate them with hormones and growth factors. And skeletal muscle will respond to both these things with a hypertrophy response. Again, this is an increased, an example of an increased workload, but something that is more typically physiologic is the uterus during pregnancy in response to, to hormones in the growing fetus. This is something that uh, does undergo hypertrophy in addition to hyperplasia. And again, this is a type of increase in muscle cells because they are adding to their, uh, the amount of protein that consequently increases their size. And this type of size is beneficial for the organism. So this is a type of physiologic adaptation. But on the flip side, there are also pathologic types of hypertrophy. And this is just causing some kind of harm to the body itself. Now within pathology, most of the studies on pathologic hypertrophy are based on the heart and specifically the left ventricle. And this is also um, due to an increased functional demand on the ventricle, usually secondary to some kind of atherosclerotic disease, which actually forces the heart to pump harder 
to get blood out to the body, but the resulting hypertrophy that occurs is actually maladaptive and, and is obvious, as is obvious here, as the wall gets thicker and thicker, there's actually less volume within the heart itself for blood to actually fill, uh, fill into. And the contraction actually becomes, you know, less effective after a point. So this maladaptive change will, it can and sometimes does lead to heart failure, arrhythmias and sudden death. So this is a type of pathologic hypertrophy. Next, uh, hyperplasia. This is an increase in the number of cells in an organ or tissue in response to some kind of stimulus. Uh, usually the stimulus is some kind of growth factor driven proliferation of mature cells. And in some cases there is going to be an increased output of new cells, of new cells from tissue based stem cells. And again, although this is distinct from hypertrophy, this is something that often occurs alongside hypertrophy. And since these cells are increasing in number, you're going to see this in tissues where these cells are actually capable of dividing. Similar to hypertrophy, there are physiologic and pathologic responses within hyperplasia. Uh, now an example of a physiologic type of hyperplasia. This is going to be the result of hormones or growth factors occurring in several circumstances. Typically when there is a need either to increase the functional capacity of hormone sensitive organs or if there is some compensatory need to increase after some damage or resection. And your liver is actually a good example of an organ that can do this. Livers are pretty amenable to regrowth after after a large piece of them is cut off they'll actually regrow back to their normal size um, but some other tissues that you could consider are a female breast during puberty while they do uh, enlarge and undergo hypertrophy there is hyperplasia that takes place within these uh, within the glandular portion of the tissue in the breasts as well on the flip side a pathologic type of hyperplasia typically this is caused by some kind of excessive or inappropriate action of hormones or growth factors on the cells that are increasing in number. We do see this in, as you see here, a kind of benign prostatic hyperplasia, and this is something that's just increasing the number of cells within the prostate, and it's pathologic because it's actually going to compress the urethra and make it actually more difficult for males to urinate, and this is typically due to excessive androgen stimulation. Seen in females, endometrial hyperplasia is an example of uh, another example of this, and that's also often due to abnormal hormone causes. And now, while hyperplasia is distinct from cancer, the the kind of environment that creates this pathologic hyperplasia also creates an environment in which cancerous proliferations may eventually arise. Next is atrophy. So this is a reduction in the size of an organ of tissue, typically due to a decrease in either cell size or number. And again, this is, uh, or this can be pathologic or physiologic, and it's not always actually a bad thing. The actual mechanism that's taking place here is there is just a combination of decreased protein synthesis, so less proteins are being made, and there's actually an increased amount of protein degradation through this pathway called the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. Now, just to go a bit more in depth on the physiologic and pathologic aspects here, the type of atrophy that we see in the physiologic state is common during things like normal fetal development. There'll be kind of ducts and structures that typically recede and shrink away, or even throughout life, so the uterus will decrease in size after giving birth. Pathologic hypertrophy, on the other hand, has uh, multiple causes and can actually be local, so specific to one, one area in the body, or it can be generalized. Now, common causes of this type of atrophy can be things like decreased workload, so any kind of disease or trauma that causes you to be immobilized, for example. If you break uh, your, your foot or your leg and you're casted, that immobilization and decreased workload from that limb is going to result in eventual skeletal muscle atrophy and some bone resorption. And you'll even see this if you're, if you're casted for several weeks and you take that off, especially in the legs, you'll, you know, there is a noticeable size difference often between the left and the right leg muscle development. Uh, if there's a loss of innervation, so this is called denervation atrophy, and normal function, or the normal function of skeletal muscle actually is dependent on a nerve supply. So if you take that away, the muscle will atrophy. A diminished blood supply, so any kind of ischemia, especially from arterial disease, this can lead to atrophy, and this is not something that's just specific to your skeletal muscles. The brain itself actually can be affected by this as well, and it's referred to as senile atrophy.
if there is inadequate nutrition, kind of similar to the, the previous one, kind of diminished blood, diminished nutrition, if the, the muscles or the cells aren't getting what they need, they're gonna undergo atrophy. And this is you know, especially notable in protein calorie malnutrition. This is typically utilized or typically associated with the utilization of skeletal muscle protein uh, for energy. And cachexia, where there is this sort of severe wasting in patients typically who have cancer, they are you know, living in an environment where internally there's a chronic inflammatory state and the overproduction of all those inflammatory cytokines can really drive that reduction in body mass. If there is a loss of endocrine stimulation, so hormone responsive tissues, so like the, the breasts and other reproductive organs are actually highly dependent on endocrine stimulation for their normal metabolism or function. Uh, in females, for example, a loss of estrogen after menopause results in, uh, in atrophy of the endometrium, vaginal epithelium, and, uh, and some of the breast structures as well. And then also pressure is another, uh, another common cause of atrophy. So any kind of tissue compression for an extended period of time can lead to this. And this can often be seen where there is an enlarging tumor. This will kind of press on the surrounding uninvolved tissue and, uh, and can cause some pressure atrophy as well as um, atrophy from ischemia because it's gonna start to cut off and close off the surrounding capillaries and blood vessels for those normal pieces of tissue. So within atrophy itself, the cell changes are going to be the same whether or not it is a physiologic or a pathologic atrophy and all the different kind of causes of atrophy, the changes uh, in the cells will be the same. So the initial response that we'll see is just a decrease in cell size and the, you know, and the number of organelles within the cell. So your body is just trying to reduce the metabolic needs of the cells just in order so those cells can continue to survive. And early on in the, atro in the atrophy process, cells and tissues will have you know, diminished function, but cell death is pretty minimal. But as, you know, as atrophy kind of goes on, or if there's a prolonged state of ischemia, loss of innervation, you know, those, those other causes that we went over, this can drive cells to the point where they become irreversibly injured and die, uh, typically through apoptosis. And this is also seen when, you know, you remove the endocrine stimulation. And the, the typical mechanism of this type of atrophy is a decrease in protein synthesis. So this is reducing the metabolic activity and there is increased protein degradation within cells themselves. Nutrient deficiency and disuse can activate these ubiquitin lice ligases. And this is, what this is gonna do is attach a small peptide called ubiquitin to the cellular proteins and it is basically just flagging them for degradation in proteasomes. And in many situations, atrophy is accompanied by increased autophagy and autophagy is just uh, means self-eating. So these cells that are really hurting for energy or you know, any kind of nutrition will start to eat their own components to try and uh, reduce their you know, nutrient demand so they can actually meet the, the supply. Next and last is gonna be metaplasia. Now this is a reversible change in which one differentiated cell type is replaced by another differentiated cell type. So just to be clear, this is not a change in the phenotype of a differentiated cell already. So, you know, the skin cells on the outside of your skin, these are fully differentiated um, skin cells. These are not gonna change, it's gonna be uh, you know, reprogramming the stem cells that are producing these mature cells or any kind of undifferentiated cells within your tissue, those can be programmed to, um, you know, to become a different type of cell. Now, typically these precursor cells are, you know, as we were saying, they're gonna differentiate down a different pathway. And this is typically driven by cytokines, growth factors, and any kind of components within the extracellular environment. So. Now you might ask, why does this actually occur? And this is typically a result of one cell type being sensitive to a particular stress and is repeatedly exposed to that type of stress. So it is gonna be, you know, it's gonna get replaced by a cell that is now better able to withstand that new stress. And, uh, and as we were saying, again, it's not a change in the phenotype of an already differentiated cell. So, you know, this little wood fence is not gonna turn into a brick fence, but uh, instead of continuing to make pieces of wood, if they're sensitive you know, to fire, your body's gonna go, okay, I'll make these brick cells, which are better able to handle this heat exposure. Um, but 
on the flip side, there's you know there's always a catch. The you know this brick side may not be as flexible as the wood side for this example. But what does that actually look like in your body? Typically, this is seen in your epithelial scales because these are most often exposed to the external environment. And keep in mind, epithelial cells are found on the outside and the inside of your body. And changes that we will see are things like columnar to squamous metaplasia or squamous to columnar. So in a columnar to squamous example, um, something or somewhere well where you will see this is in the respiratory tract in response to chronic irritation. So things like smoking, a lot of um, you know the chemical and heat exposure is going to sort of damage those columnar cells and they'll turn into squamous cells which are better able to respond to that kind of insult. And in the esophagus, which is uh, what we're seeing here, the kind of very distal aspect of the esophagus before it gets to the stomach, is where we're getting a transformation of squamous to columnar, or is where it's typically seen and is referred to bare esophagus. And this is in response to gastric acid reflux. The columnar cells are much more protective versus the acid compared to the squamous epithelium, which is designed to have kind of food scraped, um, scraped down and along it. So it is going to start to change into this columnar type. So basically the acid doesn't dissolve your skin away. And similarly in the lungs, as we were talking about before, that squamous epithelium, which is much better for defending against the, you know, the heat and, and the chemicals from things like smoking, um, that's great. But the columnar epithelium there actually has cilia and mucus secretion ability. And these are important for protection against the, you know, infection control and clearance of debris. So this is, um, you know, well, it's protective against the initial insult. Again, you're losing something, so it's not, it's not always beneficial in the long term. Now, to be clear, cells within metaplastic epithelium, so where one cell type phenotype has changed to another, these are not cancer cells. But long term, you know, long term metaplasia can be more prone to developing cancer. And if you think about it, that sort of makes sense. You're changing cells from one type. To another and it's a you know it's a protective response against stress but that constant you know exposure to change and change and change makes it more likely that something might you know change in a bad way and that could lead to the cancer so just to quickly sum all that up your cells are going to undergo these types of adaptive responses when some kind of stress is introduced that disrupts the original cell from homeostasis this uh, and then this is going to drive some type of adaptation to make these cells better able to respond to their environment. Then atrophy, cells are shrinking, hypertrophy, they're growing in size, hyperplasia, an increase in number, and metaplasia, a change in the cell phenotype. Now typically when these stresses are removed, cells will revert to their sort of baseline level. If the cell injury or the stress is so severe that cells cannot adapt, they will either become injured and eventually heal if that stress is removed, or they will end up dying. And this cell death is what we will cover in our next video.